a preacher takes Jesus as their example, then today's text demands the unachievable. I am supposed to announce the good news with such clarity that we see the truth of ourselves so clearly that you, the congregation, who ordinarily love me, I think, <laughs> uh, will want to kill me. I'm not entirely convinced that I can do that. So the question is, who has been Christ to you? Who has told you the truth about your life so clearly that you would do appalling things to make them shut up? This question is inspired by Barbara Brown Taylor. She once led a retreat, and she asked the retreatants, who has been Christ to you? While many had the usual compliments for those special persons who had been there in hard times, one woman hesitated before answering, and she gave a rather unpredictable, non-scripted reply. When she finally spoke up, she said, I had to think hard about that question. I kept thinking, who is it that has told me the truth about myself so clearly that I wanted to kill them for it? Barbara Ta Brown Taylor says further, she burst our bubble. But she was onto something vitally important that most of us would be glad to forget. Namely, that the Christ is not only someone who comforts and rescues us, the Christ is also someone who challenges and upsets us, telling us the truth so clearly that we would do appalling things to make them shut up. So if we continue in this task, who has been Christ to us? a Christ who has told us the truth about our lives and our society so clearly that we could hardly bear to hear it. I wanted some contemporary examples of who had been Christ for others, Christ to our society, people who had held up a mirror so that we could see the blind spots in ourselves, in our society. I came up with three examples, and as an addendum, I neither condone nor disagree. They're just examples of what happens. The first example is what I consider to be a mild-mannered and seemingly harmless writer from the UK. In February 1989, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa, a death sentence, on this writer, his publishers, and his translators. The author went into hiding with round-the-clock police protection and remained in hiding for about 30 years. Although he was not harmed, his Japanese translator was stabbed to death in 1991, and his Italian, Norwegian, and Turkish translators were seriously injured in these separate attacks. Who is this Christ figure? Simon Rusty. Perhaps another example is an Adelaide academic who was murdered in 1972 for his difference from others. He became a martyr and his murder sparked a necessary reform. Homosexuality was decriminalised after his death in 1975 in South Australia, 1976 in the Capital Territory, and in Victoria in 1980. And so who is this Christ figure? It's George Duncan. And perhaps the third Christ figure who offers a difference so loud for us and so challenging that our response and behaviour is appalling is closer to home. How about Adam Gooders? 
and the challenge and reform that results from him, our Christ figure, who shows up a truth in ourselves and our society so clearly that we silence him through dehumanizing him. So let's take a closer look at what is going on here in our contemporary examples and what actually is going on in the gospel. Our reading begins with today, the word has been fulfilled in your sight. And at this point, people are applauding Jesus. He's given a fantastic sermon, a clapping, awesome. I feel somewhat sympathetic to Jesus. One of the first times I had to preach was in the Methodist church that I'd grown up. It's rather awkward looking across the congregation, knowing that the people in front of you have known you from the time that you were three years old. I wonder if this is what it was like for Jesus. And in his opening sermon, Jesus explains why he is there. And contrary to what conventional Christianity might teach, why did Jesus come? Oh, to die for our sins. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus explains that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him and that his mission is to set free the captives and to announce economic reform, a year of jubilee, of restoration to the poor, the refugees, the oppressed, the excluded. This is what they applaud, a sermon he's adopted from Isaiah 61. As you know, there are two differences that he offers. He leaves out what Isaiah puts in. Isaiah speaks of the day of vengeance of the Lord. Jesus omits that. And at the center of his sermon, he adds something that Isaiah forgot to put in. And that is recovery of sight to the blind. So there's something here that the author of Luke's gospel wants us to see. So what is it that we are meant to be seeing? So this beginning part of Luke's gospel shows how after an initial positive response, the crowds turn against Jesus because he goes outside of the, respect, of the respected in Israel and reach out to sinners, toll, toll collectors and outcasts. Luke is arguing that such outreach, outreach to Gentiles and unacceptables, incited anger anger and hatred, and led to Jesus' execution. So in this gospel, we have a, a premonition of what eventually will happen. So Luke is using this opening theme of Jesus' ministry as a key to interpret the books that follow, the gospel of Luke and Acts. This simple key is likely to lead to oversimplification, and we can do injustice to this process. Luke's Gospel is written about a hundred years after the Jesus movement, and his church is facing fierce competition. There's fierce competition from resurgent Judaism, and his church had to grapple with the fact that they were a failure. They were a failure among the Jews. While the church was successful in its Gentile mission, it didn't take root among the Jews. And so one of the sub-themes of his book is pastoral. He's helping his church come to terms with this failure. And so with this background in mind, we need to think carefully before adopting Luke's approach. I suggest that what Luke is offering us is insight into the human condition. We have this drive to fit people into categories and boxes.
We lose knowledge control when the unfamiliar confronts us. The people were perhaps saying, Jesus is just the boy from down the road. Who does he think he is? And so many people have to leave home and leave their local communities before they are allowed to spread their wings. At one level, Luke's message is simple and uncontroversial. If you join this Jesus movement in living a life of compassion that is inclusive and without prejudice, without excluding the despised and feared, you will be living life in the spirit, but you'll be courting danger. However, if you start hating the sources of that danger and thus dehumanizing the enemy, you have become a part of the problem rather than the solution. How often do we see this? Fundamentalists against fundamentalists. The progressive movement is as rigorous in its evangelical ardor as it is against the evangelicals against whom they complain. So the mission and message of Jesus is about undermining the dehumanizing categories we apply to people. And perhaps part of the solution is found in Luke's mentor, Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians. The solution is the practical working out of love. And when people embody the type of love described by Paul, the type of community Jesus envisioned, as recorded in Luke, becomes possible. And so it's an exercise I've done before. But here is the solution. Ken is patient. Anthony is kind. Susan envies no one. Leslie always rejoices with others. Now I've forgotten the text. I have to look it up. <laughs> What's your name? Martin? Jude bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. Alan is not envious or boastful or arrogant. It doesn't insist on her own way. Desiree is not irritable or resentful. I don't know why you're laughing. That is very unkind. <laughs> Bruce does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. I wish. <laughs> so the practical artworking is that we love all and we become the embodiment of love. And I end with what helps me understand this clearly. My challenge for myself is to be curious about people and to receive them without label. So here I have two black shirts. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Did you see that? Here, let me hold it up one at a time. I'm not as clever as I think. Don't bust it for me. <laughs> so here's one black shirt. Yeah? Short sleeve shirt. It's a bit older. This is a newer shirt. Can, can you describe the differences to me?
Well, that one's a bit faded. One's been well worn, but essentially. Sorry. Why is why is this shirt more worn than this shirt? This has been loved more. Why is this one loved more? It's pretty much the same shirt. Could you help me, Susan? I'll even show you the measurements. Could you just hold that there like that? Now, let's see. If I do that... It's pretty much the same. Do you know what the difference is between these two shirts? Just a bit of writing. So because of this bit of writing, this, the boys will have to explain this to me afterwards because it's beyond my understanding. <laughs> so because of this piece of writing, just a little bit of cheap print, yeah? This shirt is probably about $120. And it's loved. And this shirt, which to my mind is exactly the same and looks a bit better, is $3. $3. I have to charge you got $120 a pocket as a charge. $3 from Big W. Because. I think they come from the same factory. I can even prove it to you. This says, made in China, poly cotton. Oh, well, made in South Africa. There goes that theory. <laughs> <laughs> this is organic cotton, oh. made in Bangladesh. Oh. You, you, can, you can see the point being made, that merely because of a label, some things are loved more than others. And so our encouragement in building the type of inclusive community envisioned by Jesus through the words of Luke, which may cause some difficulty for the status quo, is to love beyond the label, to receive people openly and curiously and to begin to embody the poem described in 1 Corinthians 13. Until all people say of all of us what Paul says of love, that we are patient, kind and generous, that we are not arrogant or boastful, and that we never rejoice in wrong, but always rejoice in truth. Thank you for listening.